What's up, guys? This is a Not Your Business Podcast, a podcast where we talk about anything but your business and ask questions that's no one's business. Now, it is my mission to bring you inspiring soaring talent from the heart. We all go through struggles. It doesn't matter what our background is, but we can overcome it. And I'm going to show you how. Thank you for joining me today. Now, let the show begin. <laughs> Welcome, Amanda, None of Your Business Podcast. How are you? I am awesome, despite the world ending and the sky falling. This, right? So, who are you? What do you do? Um, like you said, my name is Amanda. I'm a mind body wellness coach, uh, addiction recovery support coach. I'm also a fitness model and a yoga instructor. So, kind of jack of all trades or Jane of all trades, as it were. Right on. So, how did you get into the. Uh, fitness model? I'd actually been modeling since I was 16 anyway. And when I realized the support and help that I can give through, you know, fitness and nutrition and yoga and everything, it just kind of fell into place that it made sense because I had kept myself in such good shape and I already had the modeling experience. It kind of made sense that that was the next step in my journey. Okay. Okay. So, and then you're, also in recovery. So what did that look like? Like how, what was your story? Well, it was freaking ugly. <laughs> Let's be honest. No recovery story is pretty. I have been clean from cocaine and self-harm for just over 18 months, about 19 months now. Um, right on. Right on. And it was, it was hard. I'm not going to lie. I don't want anybody to think that recovery is an easy thing. I was in a very, very dark place and my recovery actually a few months after my sobriety date, I ended up almost taking my life because I just couldn't handle at the time, not knowing what to do. And I'd use this, I'd use cocaine to numb myself or self harm to kind of balance the pain, you know, the mental to the physical pain. Mm -hmm. I'd done that for so long that I didn't know what else to do. And it became so overwhelming. I didn't have the skills necessary to really find any level of even contentment, let alone joy in my life. Oh, for sure. So like when you first started using cocaine, like was it just like at a party here and there? Was it to get like, since you're in the modeling to stay skinny? Like what, what's the underlining problem of like, why did you start? Well, there, the first time was just, oh, a friend's offering it to me and it's cool. And I was a teenager and I did it and I didn't yeah. get into it. I didn't fall into addiction. It was just, oh, I did this and it felt kind of cool and okay. Um, after that, there was a few times that I used it at modeling parties, uh, modeling events and stuff. It wasn't necessarily to stay skinny, but mm-hmm. at those times it was to stay energized because I was expected to make these appearances and do these different events and stuff. And they were very back to back and it was exhausting. And... I was never going to do speed or mess, that's for sure. So cocaine it was, and it, it helped uh, keep me awake. It helped keep me going on long days. But then it kind of became more of a coping mechanism for depression. I, when my mom passed away in 2007, I really started using to cope with the grief because I didn't even know how to do my own damn laundry, first and foremost. But I didn't know who I was. I really had no idea who I was without being my parents' child. I, that's, I guess, kind of the identity that I'd set for myself. And I had no real healthy coping mechanisms aside from listening to a lot of Linkin Park. That probably is the only reason I didn't kill myself back then. And more directly, it was the reason I didn't kill myself the the last time. But I just, I didn't really have a healthy lifestyle, healthy coping mechanisms. And I turned into it then. And then once I kind of got through the grief, I guess. I, I didn't even feel the need to get sober. I guess I just didn't quote unquote need it. So I tapered off for a bit. And then I used here and there, like it was there. Uh, I ended up getting pregnant uh, in 2010, had it in 2011. And I never, I, obviously then I was never going to use when I was pregnant. That was kind of obviously motivation to stay clean yeah. when I was pregnant. And I did use a little bit after he was born uh, when I wasn't breastfeeding because again, it's exhausting. Being a new parent is exhausting. I went through untreated postpartum depression. I didn't really have any support system. 
So again, it turned into a coping mechanism. The most previous time was when it got most dangerous. It was 2017. Um, I was going through a lot of struggles anyway. I'd been wrongfully accused of a DUI. And I just want to reiterate, wrongfully accused of a DUI. I got in a car accident. Uh, I had a lot of just emotional things going on in my life. And I was using Lincoln Park to cope because that was always my coping mechanism. And the lead singer committed suicide. Okay. In summer of 2017. And I think that was just the catalyst that spun everything out of control because, like I said, that band was my coping mechanism. That's what I turned to in dark times during my life, like when I was sexually assaulted as a teenager, when I was emotionally abused in a relationship, when I lost both my parents. It very became much became my comfort, my kind of landing zone, my go-to. And when that happened in 2017, I just spun wildly out of control. Yeah. And... I started using frequently. I overdosed. Um, I, it was, it was really bad. I didn't know what to do. And I ended up getting clean when I met the other singer from Lincoln Park, Mike Shinoda. There was just something in me when I met him. It was kind of magical, actually. It's not like I had this meaningful conversation with him. It's just that when I met him, I realized, you know, I was doing a lot of charity work and hashtagging make Chester proud because that was the thing after Chester passed away, okay. was that hashtag. And I was doing a lot of charity work and stuff. And I realized I'm a freaking hypocrite. Like I'm sitting here, you know, hashtagging this and saying, make Chester proud when I am giving in to the same demons in some way, you know, that led him to where he was because he had a drug history too that made, you know, his coping yeah. and his healing really difficult. So there's just something about meeting Mike that really motivated me to want to get clean. And I did, like, I just... I'd like to say that I went through some specific program or that there was a book that I read that really inspired me. I mean, some people find it in Jesus. I found it in Mike Shinoda. <laughs> and, okay. <laughs> that was just, I feel like when you want to get clean, you have to have a why. Yeah. And that is the number one thing that I always tell people. I always ask my, my clients and stuff, what is your why? Because if you don't have that why, if you just say, okay, I want to get clean, you're probably not going to get very far and you're going to relapse. You really have to reiterate that why and for me it was my son but i didn't see the harm that i could potentially do to him because i didn't use around him uh i didn't i wasn't you know completely incapacitated around him or anything and i didn't see the harm that could potentially be done say if i got busted with it because i didn't you know i did go out and about with it if i got busted with it or you know for some reason i lost custody of him because of it no. I, that didn't cross my mind at the time i was just okay well i'm doing what i have to do to be a good mom and I was, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I was great. It helped me. It helped me cope, but it wasn't doing me any good in the long run. It wasn't helping me figure out healthy coping mechanisms. It was doing damage to my mind and body and the panic attacks coming off of it were freaking hell. I would never wish that on anyone in the world. The panic attacks coming off of cocaine were just hell, but it got me through and it gave me energy. And I told myself at the time it was worth it. It was not worth it. It was hell. But I didn't know what else there was. And in October of 2018, I had been clean since the summer and I just couldn't take it. I had so much going on. There were so many emotional things going on in my life. Uh, my relationship was going to hell. Everything was just falling apart at the seams. And I, I couldn't handle the weight that was on me at the time. And I almost took my life. And it really took going through all of that, you know, going through not only the addiction, but getting to the edge and looking down and being ready to jump yeah. and just being completely ready to end it all, realizing that it wasn't, it wasn't a reason to, it wasn't a desire to die. I didn't want to die. I just didn't want to hurt anymore. And that was actually the, the last thoughts I had while I was looking down was, I hope this doesn't hurt because I just don't want to hurt anymore. I didn't think, oh, yay, I'm so happy I'm going to die. I'm really looking forward to dying right now. That definitely was not what was crossing my mind. And I don't think that's what crosses anyone's mind who is suicidal. It's more about I don't have the resources to make the pain stop. Yeah, cocaine's not helping anymore. No. It, when, it, when I committed to getting clean off that, I'm one of those people that when I commit to – making that change. I'm going to make that change and nobody's going to stop me. And yeah. maybe I'm going to need some kind of help or support or program or therapy. Maybe I'm going to need a book or whatever. But once I decide to really, you know, make that change, I'm going to make that change. My mom was an alcoholic when she met my dad and my dad flat out said, it's the alcohol or me. And my mom who was 
a really bad alcoholic said, I choose you. And she got clean and she stopped drinking. And my dad smoked three packs of cigarettes a day from the time he was 12 until he was 55. And I went to him um, after my grandparents died and I was crying. I was a little kid at the time. And I said, daddy, I lost grandma. I lost grandpa. I don't want to lose you too. And you're killing yourself. And my dad, cold turkey, three packs a day, cold turkey right there, just said, I'm done. And cold turkey, three packs a day. So I had really good influence in my life of if you want to quit, you'll find a way. Now, let me reiterate that it's not always healthy to cold turkey. Some drugs can't be cold turkey. I totally understand that. Some do need to be worked through. But if you have your why and you really genuinely, truly want to take that next step and move forward, you will. You'll, You'll find a way. Yeah, absolutely. You know, back in uh, summer of 2018, um, I was just coming down with a relapse. Uh, I was a couple of years sober before. I ended up being homeless in Vegas for five months. And when I got back to Montana, uh, my fiance and I got in, uh, my fiance at the time, no longer with that person. Um, But anyways, like... Do I need to clap? Do I need to clap for that? (laughs) Codependent, toxic relationship. Like absolutely disgusting um but anyways that's her story uh she got arrested and i thought it was my fault i thought it was my fault so i went and got as much heroin and as meth as i could and fucking was like okay i'm going to kill myself like this is it and i ended up randomly going to my parents house and then i woke up in the icu like four days later after july 3rd so and like i thought like I thought I was going to die. Like my purpose was to die. Like my source of love, my codependent toxic relationship was gone. It's my fault. So I shouldn't live anymore. If I can't get her out of jail, if I can't anyways, just be captain, save a hope, put on my cape. Um, and like, I thought I was going to die. So when I woke up, I was like, man, I, I need to get like, I need, I need to get clean again. Like I can't drink or use like to cover up my emotions. Like I need to do something about it. So I, my point is behind, saying all this like is you gotta have a why and like this is why i started the podcast this is what i do what i do this is why i go and speak this is why i want to you know like everyone has struggles it doesn't matter what your background is like yours is cocaine mine is every drug in in the book but like we all put on these masks and cover up our emotions but it's okay to feel it's okay to have these things and just having a healthy way of expressing our emotions is something that a lot of people need to do. Like self-development is a real thing. Like it's okay to focus on yourselves. So before we started recording, you said that you had a different uh, 12 step program. Like you want to tell, tell us more about that? It's not specifically 12 step per se. Uh, <laughs> I say that I say that in the sense that some people do get help through the 12 step program. Some people get help through um, different therapy or whatever for me it was really a matter of restructuring my entire life i really had to go through a lot of different things and when i when i work with my clients on addiction not only do we have to really talk about the why but or like the why i want to get sober but why are you there that's the bigger question why are you there what do you mean When we get into an addiction, there's a reason we've fallen fallen into that. There's a reason that we've fallen into the self-harm or the drugs or whatever. In your case, it was you felt that the world was better off without you because you couldn't help your fiance. And I remember when I was suicidal, I remember standing on the ledge thinking, my son's going to be better without me. Everyone will be better without me. Nobody's really going to miss me. I'm just a burden. And I mean, depression and addiction will tell you some really screwed up things. And I think you know, having that why you're there and really starting to analyze that. So whether with addiction or not, I always kind of go through different steps. And I'm actually releasing a program at the end of this month that that goes over those steps specifically, because I want to be able to reach more people right now. I feel like so many people are needing help right now, that it's very hard to keep doing one on one coaching. And I feel like after a while, I'm coaching the same things. So while it's not specifically for addiction, it, it has helped a lot of addicts. It is kind of the process they go through of where are you at? Where do you need help? What areas of your life are you really needing to focus on to get out of the mindset that's made you feel the need to have these drugs or self-harm or alcohol or whatever in the first place? And 
like I said, well, it's not 12 steps. I think there are very specific steps that we can take to improving our lives in a way that no matter where we are on our happiness spectrum, which is what I call kind of the, the, the gamut of our emotions. So I am capable of feeling desolate depression or crazy over the top giddiness. I mean, you should have seen me when Tom Ellis got naked on Lucifer, that episode, definitely giddy. But I have the capacity of feeling like rock bottom or yeah. top head in the clouds. Some people don't. Mm -hmm. And when I was depressed, I was very much, my neutral was a depressed state. My neutral, when I, when I wasn't even triggered by anything, was depressed. Okay. When I started healing, my neutral now is happy. Like when I don't have any outside stimuli, my neutral is to feel happy. And I think helping people move their own happiness spectrum, because it's not really possible to change how intensely people feel emotions. It is, however, possible to change what emotions they're feeling okay. and to change how they respond to the depression, to change uh, how, you know, their cravings and stuff. We can change that. So focusing on that and focusing on getting people as high as possible on their happiness spectrum so that they're on the happier side of neutral. And that's really what the program is about is going through the steps. Um, there's, there's fewer than 12, my friends, so it's a little bit easier <laughs> going through the steps to be able to be as high as possible on your happiness spectrum. Okay. Okay. So what are like three tips that you could give somebody who's like new to your process? To my process or to healing addiction specifically? Let's do healing addiction specifically. Yeah, for sure. That's... For me, one of my biggest things was stress relief. The importance of being able to combat stress. Because if I didn't do that, my cravings were going to be out of control. If I didn't do that, I'd keep justifying more and more reasons to use more. And even when I would have never called myself an alcoholic, but there was a time when I used alcohol to cope as well with you know depression and anxiety and stuff. And if I didn't manage my stress, if I didn't do anything to manage my emotions and kind of learn to not control your emotions per se, but to have some kind of, of um, hold on them so that they're not controlling you, um, to have some kind of management on them, that was my biggest thing. And that looks different to everybody. Some people it's reading, some people it's yoga, some people it's exercise. For me, it's all of the above. <laughs> I have a lot of different ways to cope and a lot of different ways to reduce stress uh, on a day-to-day -day basis or yeah. when I'm kind of in crisis. And I've utilized those skills to get through cravings and to get through the hard days. If you're just sucking it up day-to-day -day and you're in that constant high stress level and your body's constantly flooded with cortisol, Number one, you're going to be exhausted. So if it's a stimulant that you were um, using, that you abused, that's going to make it even harder for you because now your body is feeling depleted all the time and you're going to have a stronger desire to use, which kind of brings me, I guess, I don't know if this is the second point, but just making sure that you're getting enough sleep because if you don't, you're not going to have enough energy. It's going to knock your mood down. It's going to knock your depression all wonky. And it was really important for me to start figuring out because I had really bad insomnia, especially from using, you know, it does throw off your sleep schedules. Uh, and I was using it different times of the day, which yeah. really threw off my, my rhythm. And I really had to start adapting things that helped my sleep schedule. I actually am making a video about that because I had so many people say, I'm having insomnia issues right now during this, this Corona crisis, or I have insomnia issues. What would you suggest? And I'm, I'm going to be making a video about that in the next couple of weeks for my YouTube channel because sleep is important to everyone, but especially people struggling with addiction, mental health, depression, anxiety, those things. It's really, really, really important that you're recharging your mind so that you're not depleted of energy, so that you're not susceptible to the symptoms of depression, to the cravings. That's really vital. Uh, and I know this one is strangely kind of controversial but nutrition like taking care of your body and uh, yeah. recognizing that mind body connection for me if i eat crap i'm gonna feel tired if i feel tired i want to use cocaine so um not just making sure that you're getting enough food you know enough food but enough nutrients like making sure that you're eating nutrient dense food that you're not eating a bunch of processed crap it's yeah. funny because people will often tell me, well, you can't heal yourself through nutrition. 
Well, I would kind of argue that even if you're right, you can definitely give yourself a fighting chance. You can definitely give your mind a fighting chance. There are nutrients that if you're deficient in them, it will affect your mental health. Yeah, and absolutely. I, I actually have, a, if you sign up for my newsletter on my website, I actually have a free cheat sheet you can download that gives you the top 10 nutrients that affect mental health and sources for each of them. So make sure to check that out. But there's, there's so many connections between what we're putting into our body and how it affects our mental health. Drugs, many of the drugs actually do just exacerbate depression symptoms. So, it, it, you know, it's tying into mental health. But with nutrition, you know, if you're, if you're constantly keeping those, those serotonin levels and those oxytocin levels depleted, uh, or you're constantly keeping your cortisol levels high, which is affected by food, um, if you're constantly keeping those out of balance, then you're just leaving yourself more susceptible to mental health struggles, to depression, and in, by extension, to addiction, and also to um, additional cravings if you already struggled with addiction. Yeah. So I just think recognizing and honoring that, that connection between what we're putting in our body, how that affects our mental health, how that's going to affect our cravings, taking care of ourselves during that time. I know when I was getting clean, I really had to... I had no support really, which is a really harsh thing. I didn't tell most people. And the person I did tell, a couple of people I did tell either didn't understand at all or were actually kind of mean, cruel about it. No. And that was really hard trying to, you know, find my own strength. And I just had to like desperately hold on to that why, like it was my damn life wrapped, because it really was. Um, but so somebody else who's listening doesn't have any support like what can you suggest to them there's always some place to turn i mean i'm sure that they could email you they could email me there's always places there's always even if it's a facebook group i know that there's some facebook groups or whatnot for um for addiction recovery or for addicts that are very very conscientious about not posting triggery things about not allowing people to post super triggery things and it just gives you a, a community that you can go to i actually have a Facebook group that I just started. It's just about community and connection and helping each other. And um, again, if you if you go to my website, if you do sign up for my mailing list, you'll get an exclusive invite to that group. But it it's important to to kind of create your own. Maybe your parents aren't supportive. Maybe your best friend isn't supportive or doesn't get it. But that's not your only means of support. There's always support groups. There's uh, support groups online. There's even if you find some person who's telling their story and is sharing their struggles most of the time if you reach out they're going to be more than happy to help you through it because they know what it's like i know i'm like that if somebody emails me or instagrams me or you know, messages me on, on whatever platform i am definitely going to be very cognizant that i was there two months and that person needs support so i mean even on a personal level if somebody out there is listening and they need someone to talk to and they feel like they don't have support in their life, I would personally be happy to hear their story, to listen, to help them if I can. And I'm not saying that to try and sell my coaching or sell my program. That's absolutely not my point here. My point is connection. My point is helping other people. Do I think that, that helps some people? Sure. Do I think that, you know, 12 step programs have help some people? Sure. Do I think there's books out there that help some people? Sure. But just making sure that in whatever way you can, you're staying connected. I know that we're in a time right now of social distancing, but I like to think of that more as physical distancing. We're not really social distanced at all. I mean, I'm talking to you right now. We're having right? this conversation. Yeah, you're, you're listening to, to these podcasts. Um, we're real people. Like uh, you and I, we're real people sitting here having this conversation, this important conversation. There are 7 billion people in this world. You never have to feel like you're alone. You never have to feel like you don't have support because there's so many people that will, that will talk you through this and really be there for you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So Amanda, besides you being, you know, a coach, a fitness model, like, what do you do? I know like right now the world's shut down, so you can't really do what you want to do, but what are your hobbies? I know a lot of people ask me about my hobbies. So actually for me, this has been kind of a nice time of self-reflection. I've been getting to read. I forgot how much I love to just sit down with a book, an actual real dead tree book. <laughs> not any of those Kindles or anything. Just I love the smell of books. I love turning the pages. I love to read and I forgot how much I really love to read. Obviously, I'm really big into yoga. There's uh, I love to write. I just I wrote my own book. I kind of wrote my story, which I'm querying agents currently for that. But 
I love to write. I love to write articles. I love to even just journal. Um, when there's not a crisis and the world's not shutting down, I like to go horseback riding. I love to travel. I've been to a lot of different countries. Um, I, I taught myself French to be able to serve girls in really? Africa and whatnot because I am the Arizona chapter leader of Days for Girls, and we so reusable feminine hygiene kits for girls for their menstrual cycle. Oh, cool. And I really wanted to be able to go to Haiti, and Haiti is a Francophone country. And after this trip, I went on to Mexico in 2015, where I made an orphan girl cry because I didn't speak Spanish. I said, I am never going to another country ever again where I don't speak the language. <laughs> so I taught myself French from scratch. And I actually gained like a huge passion for the language. I kind of fell in love really? with the language. Uh, so it's, it's just been really awesome for me. And now when I hear it and I understand where I can speak it, it just, it's such, it actually was a great thing for my anxiety too, because it forces you to be mindful, which is a kind of an unexpected uh, side effect, but you're, you're mindful when you're trying to, you know, formulate a sentence in a language that's not your mother tongue. It kind of forces you to be mindful. So uh, it was really helpful to me through my anxiety and depression. But um, And I'm also a Legend of Zelda nerd. I have a Triforce really? tattoo on my hand. I love playing specifically old school games. Like my favorite was Majora's Mask and then Twilight Princess for all the nerds out there. I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, it was just uh, two different... Uh, games in the Legend of Zelda series. One was oh, for, okay. yeah. One was for N sixty four, like way back in the day. So I guess I just aged myself. <laughs> I like I'm twenty six, so like I, I don't know. I don't. I wouldn't say age yourself, but anyways, go on. Sorry. No, you're fine. I still have my original Nintendo. I gave really? away all my stuff. I actually give away a lot of my games and stuff, but I just couldn't bring myself to give away my Nintendo and my, my Zelda games, so I kept my original Nintendo. I did have a Super Nintendo, but I ended up giving it away because I, I have a system that has all the games. It's like I went through this purging declutter phase and got rid of that, but yeah, I, I guess I don't have any super unique um, hobbies. Oh, I take that back. I really love geocaching with my son. Um, for those of you that don't know what geocaching is, it's kind of a real life treasure hunt. So you download yeah. this app on your phone and it'll take you to different coordinates and you have to find, sometimes it's just a little a piece of paper that you sign saying you were there. Sometimes there's little trinkets, but yeah. my, my kid loves that. So we, we, we do that sometimes and it gets us out and about till it's Arizona summer on 125 degrees, then it's, I'm going to lay here <laughs> in a block of ice. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So Amanda, if you could wake up and have the perfect day, what would that look like? Can I wake up next to Tom Ellis? The actor that plays the You can wake up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For me, I, there's so many aspects of that because there's the personal aspect of, I, I do want to wake up next to someone that you know makes me happy, makes me feel energized. I, I definitely would like that. But getting to spend time with my son, getting to serve people. I'm really big on humanitarian work. I, I'm always, you know, got my feet in some charity. A lot of it is, yeah, a lot of it is animal rescue. I do dog rescue, dog fostering. Like I said, I do videos for girls. I do homeless outreach. I've always got my feet in something. But just being able to, to help people, to know that I'm living a life that is helping people. Yeah. I don't really care specifically what I'm doing in a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, I, I love being able to get up and have enough time to do my yoga and have my reishi cacao hippie tea, you know. I love that. And I do actually get that on those days. So the ironic thing about it is I'm kind of, minus Tom Ellis, already there. Like I wake up and I'm super, I, I woke up this morning super happy. I woke up this morning enthusiastic to start my day and maybe I'm not rich by most people's standards maybe I don't have success by most people's standards but I am comfortable I'm making it through this this yeah. time where a lot of people are kind of just losing their their shit and buying up loads of toilet paper and each other. <laughs> I legit watch people almost kill each other over canned corn all right like I'm, what yeah I watch the old ladies literally almost kill each other over canned corn it's insane and it was cheap canned corn too, like crappy canned corn. Wow. I, I, yeah, there there was a uh, some kind of domestic dispute at the grocery store. Like the cops had to be called for a domestic dispute over uh, tampons, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, y'all, 
Like, there's other options. I'm just letting you know that. There's other options for dealing with your menstrual cycle than killing someone over it. But, Jeez. Yeah, like, I, I never thought I'd be saying this, especially considering, you know, a couple of years ago, I was at a point, not even a couple of years ago, I was at a point where I was ready to end my life, to now waking up and saying, you know, I, I love this thing. I, there's not really much else I can ask for. I don't need money. I don't need success. Would I like to wake up to that email saying, you're going to be on the cover of this magazine? Absolutely, I would. And there's a lot of little things that could bring, you know, more joy and fulfillment to my life. I, I love getting surprises. I love, you know, getting one more, one more magazine spread or one more podcast or being able to help one more person. But, you know, there's, there's not, I don't think that there's a day that I would just wake up and say, okay, I've arrived because I feel like I kind of already have, you know? Awesome. That's awesome. And, but like saying that right there, you are where you are. Like, let's hope for somebody like you're doing what you want. Yeah. And you I, went from I, suicide I, to living the life that you designed for yourself. Like that's, that's awesome. Like, fuck yeah. Like, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. It's probably the most powerful thing. I and mean, actually just saying it out loud right now. I mean, I kind of intrinsically realize it, but just saying it out loud right now is so powerful to realize I don't really want for anything. I don't really, I don't feel like something is lacking. I feel like when you're in the state of, of really clinical depression, you just feel this hole and you feel like something is lacking in your life and you feel like you're missing something and you don't know what that is. And some people turn to religion and some people turn to drugs and some people turn to food and you, you try to fill in that hole, but now I realize, you know, could things get better? Sure. Could I get more opportunities? Sure. But I'm okay with where I'm at right now. And if I died tomorrow, I mean, I don't have a lot of regret. I've, I've traveled the world. I've lived my dream. I got to shoot for Playboy. That was also one of my dreams. So I've lived so many of my crazy dreams that most people looked at me and told me, oh, you can't do that. Like literally just like that. I had so many friends that I'd share my dreams with them and say, man, I really at the time I was a single mom like I, I had my son he was still young and they're like oh you can't do that or I'd say I really want to meet such and such a celebrity and I'd be like oh that's cute you're, you're cute you know but nobody ever took me seriously and finally I just said you know what screw you I'm going to do all these things and I shot for Playboy and I met um, many many celebrities that I looked up to and it wasn't for oh my god you're so and so it was this person really touched my life in some way or yeah. maybe it was just kind of a, a throwback to my childhood i got to meet i don't know if you remember the show boy meets world but i got to meet sean and eric from boy meets world and it was just such a fun really? throwback to my childhood it was like i was so in love with sean hunter when i was oh. young so it was it was a really cool part to my childhood. Um, I got to meet all the members of NSYNC. Uh, when I was 13, I was supposed to meet them all, and my dad went to the hospital, so I didn't get oh. to. So as an adult, I went back and <laughs> stopped <laughs> each of them down <laughs> <laughs> at, different, at different events and stuff. Okay. And I, met them. I met Chuck Norris. By the way, that guy has the wussiest handshake I've ever seen in my life. Really? But yeah, it was so surprising. What? He tried not to break my hand or something. I don't know, but I was a little... Uh, Shell shocked. I got to meet Harry Potter. So, I mean, that was, it was just fun experiences that made life a little bit more joyful for me. It had nothing to do with, oh my God, you're a celebrity. It was, you were a part of my life. And I just wanted to shake your hand, take a picture with you, you know, solidify that in some way. It was, it's just kind of a fun, I guess it's another hobby for me. It was just meeting you know, the people that were such intimate parts of my life at some point. And, um, don't let any. I remember in what's what was the movie? Uh, Ten Things I Hate About You, where Heath Ledger's character said, "Never let or don't let anyone ever make you feel like you don't deserve what you want." Mm -hmm. And I think that is so powerful because I listened to those people most of my life. I was the outcast kid. I was always told I wasn't good enough. I didn't wear the right clothes. My boobs weren't big enough. My hair wasn't the right color. People will find reasons to tear you down. They will oh, yeah. always find things to pick up out about you and. Once I finally did like get boobs or whatever, once I once I grew into boobs, then it's oh well, now you're just a, a hooch. Now you're you know it's always something. People are mm -hmm. insecure with themselves. They're always going to talk shit about you. Oh yeah, it's and their low self image. They have is. to attack them to make them feel better, or attack yes. you to make themselves yes. feel better. And once I finally stepped out of that and said, you know what, I'm going to do what I want to do, 
Mm-hmm. And I'm going to take pictures and send it to you. <laughs> I had so many people from high school and stuff that messaged me after I shot for Playboy that were like, hey, you remember me? I haven't talked to you in forever. I'm like, yeah, I remember you. Because the last time you were talking to me, it was shit. You were talking shit. Right. Or you didn't talk to me at all. So no, I don't ever remember having a conversation with you just because you were in my grade in school or we shared a class in eighth grade or whatever. But it was just right. funny to see those people that told me I wasn't good enough the minute that I achieved something. All of a sudden, it's, oh, hey, how are you? Right. They talk shit about you until... You prove them wrong. Yeah, exactly. And then, oh, oh, you're in Playboy? Oh, whatever. You got money now? Let me, you're doing this now? Like, fuck you. Like, yeah. I fucking hate fake people. It's fucking, bu- it's bullshit. I, I don't. Um, so let's go back in the Playboy thing. And I'm not talking about like the <laughs> sexual aspect by any means. I want to talk about the experience. Like, what, what did that look like? You know, I'm so glad you brought that up because I haven't really talked about the emotional aspect of it much. Uh, but when I when I was there, when I was at the shoot, it was something I'd always wanted to do. And the only reason I hadn't really pursued it is because number one, people told me I wasn't good enough. Number two, people were very judgmental about the aspect of shooting nude. But for me, I grew to a place at the time where I was proud of my body. I was proud of who I was. I didn't any longer believe that I, like all the things that people were telling me. So for me, it was empowering. It was that moment of, I feel good in my skin and I'm okay with yeah. people seeing it. I mean, we were all born naked. We're all going out naked. And I don't have that same relationship with nudity that a lot of people do to me. It's beautiful. It's artistic. It's not sexual to me by default. And I know people would argue that, um, with Playboy, people can use it sexually, but what they do with it is on them. That's not really on me. For me, it was just an empowering experience to be able to kind of come out of my shell, to grow my wings, to step into the beauty that was always there that I'd ignored for so long. And it was a fun experience. I mean, just on the surface level, but I, I did end up getting to go to the Playboy Mansion. I did meet Hef uh, before he tragically passed away. And he was actually a really nice guy he got a lot of flack you know from from people that didn't agree with his lifestyle but he was a very nice guy uh, from my limited interaction with him uh, and it was just a fun it was just a fun experience to another thing to to go down in the record books you know saying i got to do this this cool thing i got to go to the playboy mansion and um, i got to do this awesome shoot and i guess in a way it was kind of validating too you know to say well Y'all told me I wasn't pretty enough, and Hugh Hefner thinks I'm pretty enough. So, <laughs> I mean, there was there was that, that validation in some like way, but yeah. it, was, it was for me. And even now, people will still give me flack for it and say, "Well, you're all about women's empowerment, and you just got naked so a bunch of guys could masturbate to you." And I'm thinking, you know, there are people that have foot fetishes, and if you wear sandals and you kind of flip your sandal up and down. They will masturbate to that later. I know because I've talked to people with foot fetishes. Now, does that mean that I'm not going to wear sandals because of what some other person's going to do? No, because I feel comfortable in sandals and I don't really care. And my Playboy pictures were just, I, I really felt that they were so, art- so artistic. And I truthfully would have no problem whatsoever showing my child like one day, this is what mommy did. Mommy accomplished this because mommy wanted to. And she's very proud of it. I, I will, you know, maybe not at nine years old, but um, <laughs> I will one day show him the pictures and say, you know, mommy shot for Playboy, even though by the time he's a little bit older, Playboy probably won't be a thing at all anymore. But I think that making the choices that, that, that really build you up, screw what everybody else thinks, screw what everybody else says, there will always be critics and haters and people Absolutely. that tell you you're not good enough or people that tell you that you shouldn't do something. But if it's something you want to do and it's not hurting yourself or anyone else, do it. Find a way. When I traveled, so in 2015, I didn't really have any kind of established income. I, I did dog sitting and dog rescue and stuff, which I still do, but um, I didn't really have any steady income flow. And mm-hmm. I was, I just got out of school a couple of years before. I was kind of floating around. But when in 2013, I decided I really want to travel. And I don't know how I'm going to do it because I have no money, but Mm -hmm. I'm going to make it happen. And I kind of sat with that for a bit until I really cracked down, like toward the end of 2014 said, I'm going to travel. (laughs) Like This isn't, I I want to, it's I'm going to. And when I set that intention, 
the opportunity is pretty much to start falling out of the sky. And in 2015, I went to London, Paris, Rome, Iceland, Mexico, to California. Yeah. And a couple of other like little cities. And I didn't have, like, I didn't win the lottery. I didn't come up with some mysterious way to make money. I didn't strip nothing. You know, I didn't sell drugs, nothing crazy. I just, I, I, I ended up getting really good deals, like really, really crazy good deals. Uh, some of it was modeling stuff or, uh, I, I, stayed with people when I was going to California on that. So it's just a way of, if you want to make it happen, you'll make it happen. If you want to make excuses, you'll make excuses. And yeah, absolutely. During, during this time of seclusion, during this time of the coronavirus where we are right now, you can either sit in your house and make excuses and say, oh, well, everything's changing. So I can't really, you know, work out now because I can't go to the gym. Bullshit. You can jog in place. You can do jumping jacks. You can, you know, do push-ups. You can do dynamic resistance exercises. If you're in a place like me, I can still go on bike rides. I did a dance party with my nine-year-old the other day and I was sweating my butt off. We just yeah. turned on music and started dancing around the, the bedroom. And not only was it a really awesome body experience for me and my son, it was also really great cardio because I'm sweating and I'm like, my heart's racing, it was awesome. And then there's people like, you know, that do. We just make it happen. We understand, okay, this is happening and it's stressful and it sucks. Now what can I do about it? There's people that react to it and go buy all the toilet paper and kill each other over can of tampons. And there's the people that respond to it and say, okay, how can I be the best version of myself in this situation? Absolutely. And Absolutely. I think it's the same with addiction. You can say, okay, I have this disease. I have this addiction. And I can either say, okay, well, it has hold of my brain and I'm never going to get better because doctors told me I'll never get better because people tell me I'll never get better. Or I'm just a junkie and whatever bullshit people have fed you. Or you can say, I have this, this problem, this disease, whatever you want to call it, I have this. And I also have the power within myself to start to heal. And that's actually the only problem that I have with the 12-step program is the way the first step is worded, that you have to admit you're powerless to the addiction. I'm not saying that it doesn't overtake you. It's like depression. It very much does. It gets a hold on you. You can't think clearly. You can't act clearly. It does take you over. But... I feel like saying that you're completely powerless takes away the the decisions you can make and the things you can do to give yourself a better chance. So if you're just saying, well, I'm powerless, I can't do anything, just that statement and the way it's 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 phrased, the way it's framed, never really resonated with me. And that's why I didn't go through any kind of program when I was getting clean. I, I did it on my own because I didn't want anybody telling me I was powerless because if I I feel like if I heard that, I would have failed. I feel like if somebody told me you're powerless. Uh, that would have kind of set into my brain and then I would have, you know, well, acted accordingly upon that. Yeah, no, I can definitely understand how just the single step by itself. Yes, by itself. Yeah, by itself. Like, I understand, yeah, for sure. Um, that, yeah, I, I can definitely see your perspective on that one. And yeah, that, that makes sense. I would never discourage that program from people. Let me be clear that if somebody does, you know, find help, I've known several people that have, you know, utilized that to get clean. And if that's what helps you, that's yeah, what helps you. It yeah. just wasn't, it wasn't what I needed for my journey. No. And like, there's, you can go to church, you can go to therapy, you can go wherever. Like a lot of people do it cold Turkey. I don't know. Like without having a regimen, I don't know how you like going to live a happy life, but whatever, some people do it um that's fine like there's just no like the way how you just described the first step i'd never even thought about it like that because like my whole like that's just i didn't know where else to go so i dove in and i'm like i don't know what i'm doing <laughs> it was also so, hard for me because i don't have any like particular faith so for people to say you need to give it up to god i'd be like okay i did i i grew up religious and i feel like i tried to give my life to god and that didn't really work out for me so it was it was that was another thing that made it hard i feel like that just kind of ostracizes a, a group of people you know that don't resonate with the idea of faith or religion that yeah no totally. Us. totally like yeah there is you know there's a thousand different ways to get sober what, oh yeah how, what works for you Yep. What works for you might not work for me and vice versa. Like it doesn't matter. But, you know, I like how, well, I want to, you're going to go I, I'm sorry. My cut last couple of days did not go the way I thought they would go. So yeah, I am sorry, but I'm here. Um, That's what's important. Yeah. 
but like you you know how you want to say that you're not good enough but like the thing is like everyone's good enough they're perfect just the yeah. way they are like you're well, but actually I, I never really understood what makes the cut stop and think for a second what is quote unquote good enough like what does that right. even mean are, are you is that to say pretty enough is that to say make a certain amount of money and at what point like what traits do you have to have to be pretty because that's completely subjective too because what one person finds pretty another one so what is it when you get stuck in your head about i'm not good enough for who who are you not good enough for are you not yeah. you, i feel like you're you're what you're really saying is i'm not good enough for myself right now and if that's the case you can make changes for that but the only person you should be worried about being good enough for is yourself because you will never ever please everyone there will always be people that won't like you that will chastise you for your choices that will chastise you for your looks who are you trying to be good enough for yeah absolutely absolutely you know uh with my job so i work with uh troubled youth kids basically younger versions of me um and like catch them before they get there yeah well they're already there well they were there anyways that's that's their problems but that uh so we watch like disney movies like every friday night or whatever and we watched uh like mulan like last weekend or something the new one or the disney animated feature uh the disney one okay and uh like this lady or whatever they're doing i don't even know what the, they were doing this old asian lady was like <laughs> doing the ritual to make sure that she was like honorable or whatever i'm right. probably describing this terribly but she was I know the scene you're talking about. And she's checking out her looks and yeah. she like checks her body fat and says, You're not fat enough. Yeah. Which like today, it's you're not skinny enough. Yeah. Like who like who says like fat is ugly and skinny is beautiful, or vice versa? Who who says that? Or I you're just, not it's good cultural. Looking. It's depending on where you're at, where you're born, the time period you're born, who you're talking to, who you surround yourself with. And if you're surrounding yourself with people that are saying you're too fat or you're not fat enough or you're not pretty or blah, 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 get the hell away from those people. <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, you know, like I'm close with my family, but not like I used to be because like they, they would always control my life. Like, oh, which like at one point in my life, like, there needed to be some controlling because it wasn't but like anytime i want to make a decision i start a business or like move to a new city they put me down like my idea is not good enough like they have to control me they have to pay my bills to control me i'm like no now that i step away like that relationship is getting better and better like just because their family doesn't mean that they have to be your family just because you're blood related like that's just um kind of off subject but uh Actually, it's not because it's a really good point going back on the whole idea of support that we were talking about earlier. I don't really have, I have a cousin. That's really the only blood family that I keep in touch with. Okay. But I feel at this point, I've built a really good support system. I built my tribe and I would do anything for my close friends. And I feel closer to my best friend than I ever felt to any of my family other than my parents. And I do think that, you know, if you don't have a family or your family isn't good for you, mm -hmm. you can always kind of build a different family because I mean, there's, there's certain people who their family is abusive, who their family is addicts, who their family is, yeah. you know, not at all supportive. And I'm not saying that you even always have to end the relationship with your family, but mm -hmm. to just kind of, put that relationship in a different position in a different place your your parents don't have to be your support system they can just be your parents you know yeah. and then you can make you know your close friends your support system and make those people what we would identify as family because to me For family sure. just means people that love and support you it doesn't yeah. matter if they're blood I mean, if I, if my son didn't have my blood running through his veins, that would make my relationship with him any less meaningful. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That, that's a really good point on it. Yeah. People adopt kids all the, all the time yeah. and still love and support them no matter what. So, I mean, I, I had my, my doggies and they weren't even the same species as me, let alone the same bloodline. What? You didn't give birth to a dog? <laughs> well, some people do say I'm a bitch, but... <laughs> Oh, that's funny. So, Amanda, I got a couple last questions for you. Sure. One, where can people find you? Um, 
you can check out my website, amandawebsterhealth.com. Like I said before, uh, you can get that free PDF by signing up for the mailing list to find out the top 10 nutrients that affect mental health. It's really helpful, you know, for anyone really, but especially for people that are going through transitional times in their life, trying to heal from depression, anxiety, um, addiction, whatever. And you also get the exclusive invitation to my Facebook group. I'm also on Instagram at Amanda Webster Health. And I just launched a YouTube channel not so long ago. Not super active on there yet, but I am uploading really helpful, um, really helpful videos about getting better sleep about, I did one that was just a meditation for helping someone through a panic or anxiety attack. So I know that's something that's really prevalent with people that are getting clean. I know that I really struggled having panic attacks for the similar weeks after Absolutely. I was getting it out of my body. I was detoxing it. There's meditation on there that you can listen to some interviews and stuff that I did with different people that can help uh, those struggling with, with mental and physical health. I'm also going to be uploading some workouts and stuff for people to do during this time just to help them stay active. Yeah, they can't totally. go to the gym, recipes, whatnot. Um, and that's also Amanda Webster health. Awesome. Love. And like I said before, if you do need some support or if you have any further questions or if you just want somebody to tell your story too, I am definitely open to listening. So just drop me an email, message me on Instagram, or I just fill out the form on my website. I always awesome. like connecting with people. I always like hearing people's stories, whether struggles or successes. We've all been there. We all have both. So Yeah, absolutely. So final question. Dun dun dun. <laughs> Love it. What is your message to the world? There's so many of them. There's so many things that are important, but it always comes back to, and I've said this before, the last words that my dad gave me before he died, the last real close meaningful conversation I had with my dad. And at the time it was because I was all Twitter pated over this guy. I was 19. I was Twitter pated over this guy. And my dad was trying to tell me, Oh, he, you, you might get back with him. You don't know. And I think he's just trying to shut me up because he was tired of listening to his 19 year old daughter cry over this guy. But he said, don't give up hope because you never know what's going to happen tomorrow. And that was really powerful for me because it does get better. And I've realized through the ups and downs of my life, things do get better. You can make things better. Uh, you may not be able to fix everything in your life, but you can definitely make it better. You can definitely move it to a better, um, to a better situation. And really just reminding people that really just reminding people that you know even superheroes have tragic backstories so no matter where you come from no matter what your backstory is there's always a way to turn it around there's always a chance to turn it around so i just want to empower people to empower themselves to be able to become their own superhero i love it i love it right on and the brakes coming.